zoom. We don't have signed in yet, but okay. If we can begin in public session, please. Uh, we have a quorum of six members, one of whom is a member of each house. Uh, is it agreed we commence in public session? Agreed. Uh, just prior to beginning proceedings, just to the members be aware, I and committee members have received an email from Dr. John Monaghan from Port Uncula and Dr. James Clinch from Dublin expressing their concerns uh, regarding uh, the uh, hearings during the week. Um, the, the emails came in at 22.24 last night in 20.41. Um, I and the clerk were in contact and our clerk spoke to Mr. Clinch this morning. Um, and he's happy that the email that he submitted to the committee will be included in uh, the written report to government. And regarding Dr. Monaghan, uh, the clerk is going to make contact with, with Mr. Um, Dr. Monaghan this morning uh, with a view to discussing his email. And if it's agreeable to meeting, we would, as a committee, discuss it in our regular Thursday meeting next Thursday. Is that agreed? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're now in public session. Um, and I want to welcome you all, and can I again, as always, uh, remind members um, of the committee, uh, members of the media, or witnesses and members in the public gallery regarding uh, mobile phones that they're switched off for the duration um, of the meeting, as they do interfere with the uh, recording um, of broadcasting, so it's important that they're in the off position. Um, you're all very welcome this morning to our eighth session um, that the Joint Committee um, are going to go over a three-day period uh, to discuss the implementation of the government decision following the recent publication of the expert group report into matters relating to cases ABC versus Ireland. On day one of our hearing, we discussed medical issues regarding consideration, um, and yesterday we heard legal argument and legal opinion, um, and the information we have received has been beneficial uh, in, in our deliberations. <clears throat> I want, at this stage, to take the opportunity to thank all of our witnesses to date for their thoughtful and considerate submissions. I would also like to thank the members of the committee and members of the Oireachtas for their sensitive handling of the matter uh, in which we have engaged over the past three days. Uh, this measured engagement has been uh, very positive and has ensured our discussion has been constructive and informative. And as we commence the final day of our hearings, I would ask that we all continue to engage in a manner that is respectful, tolerant and understanding uh, as we go over the, final, the first two days. And I want to thank everybody for that. At the commencement of today's final sessions of our committee um, on these three-day hearings, I would like to again set out the background and intended role which these hearings are playing in this important discourse. We are here to discuss the implementation of the government decision following the recent publication of the expert group report into matters relating to cases ABC versus Ireland by way of legislation and regulation uh, within the parameters of our current constitutional provisions. Government, as members have know, has noted, has stated the aim of its action in this matter is to ensure clarity and legal certainty in relation to the process for the determination of whether termination of pregnancy is permissible in cases where there is a real and substantial risk to the life as opposed to the health of a woman as a result of that pregnancy. In doing so, we must ensure that we take full account of Article 43.3 of our Constitution. Members have elicited much detail from medical and legal experts, as I've said, over the last two days. Today, we have an opportunity to build upon this de detail and to hear of other issues which should be considered in preparing the heads of bill as per government decision. In our final session and in our first session today, we will hear from representatives of the religious groups and our churches and an atheist organization, and this will be then followed with two sessions which we will hear from advocacy groups. And I want to very much welcome our representatives this morning, and in particular, if I may just uh, single out Father Bartlett, who is a, a former class colleague of mine in Minnow, so you're very welcome. Um, before I begin, may I just uh, remind witnesses regarding privilege uh, that um, witnesses are uh, protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence you to give to the committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to seek seizing evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected to any matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person or persons or entity by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. And members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice or ruling of the chair to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against either a person outside the House or an official, either by name, in such a way as to make or him or identifiable. So with that, I want to uh, call on uh, Bishop Jones from the Diocese of Elfin to make the opening remarks. And each, each group has seven minutes to make their presentation. Remarks. Esteemed members of the thank you for your invitation to be here this morning. 
I am here on behalf of the Irish Catholic Bishops' Conference. I am joined by Father Timothy Bartlett from the Secretariat of the Conference. As an advisor on this matter, he would be happy to answer questions. We welcome this opportunity to engage with members of the We welcome to the calm and dignified way in which the discussions have been by the committee over recent days. With you and with others, we want to develop a society that is truly worthy of the dignity of every person. A society equally cherished and respected. As public representatives, you carry a heavy responsibility. In making this presentation to you this morning, I am thinking in particular of the many women in our parishes across the country who are deeply concerned about the decision to legislate for abortion. We hope you will take account of these concerns in your decisions over the coming weeks and months. We share your concern to ensure that any young girl or woman who finds herself in crisis pregnancy receives all the love, all the care and the support she needs to cope with that situation in a life-giving way. CURA, the Crisis Pregnancy Agency of the Catholic Church in Ireland, is dedicated to providing compassionate and expert support to any woman who finds herself in this situation. Compassion, understanding, respect. These should be central to any discussion about responding to a situation of crisis or difficult pregnancy. As a church, we also want to see mothers and their unborn children receive all the medical care and life-saving treatment they need during pregnancy. There is nothing in current Irish law, in current medical guidelines, or in Catholic ethics that prevents such treatment from being given. The doctors, nurses and midwives in our hospitals show an extraordinary concern for the life and well-being of mothers and their unborn children during pregnancy. These medical professionals deserve our deepest appreciation and respect. In Ireland, we have one of the lowest rates of maternal mortality in the world during pregnancy. This is something we should be proud of as a nation. It is something we should all in our power, do all in our power to cherish and protect. Any suggestion that Ireland is an unsafe place for pregnant, for pregnant mothers because we do not have abortion is a complete distortion of the truth. It is also gravely unjust to the doctors, nurses and midwives in our hospitals who have achieved such internationally celebrated standards of maternity care. We believe that these high standards of maternity care have been influenced in no small part by the recognition in Article 43.3 of Monarch the Herd that a mother and an unborn child have an equal right to life. This coincides with our belief as a church based on human reason and affirmed by sacred scripture that the life of a mother and her unborn baby are both sacred. The Catholic Church has never taught that the life of the child in the womb should be preferred to that of the mother or the life of the mother to that of the child. Moreover, there is clearly considerable confusion about the terminology being used in the discussion about medical intervention to save the life of a mother. The Catholic Church recognizes a vital moral distinction between medical intervention to save the life of the mother and abortion. Abortion understood as the direct and intentional killing of an unborn child in the womb is never morally permissible. This is because directly and intentionally taking the life of any innocent person is never morally acceptable. This is different from medical treatment to save the life of the mother where there is no other option and where the intervention does not directly and intentionally seek to end the life of the unborn baby. Every effort is made in this situation to preserve the life of both mother and baby throughout. This position, which is ethically sound, represents best practice in Irish hospitals today. However, legislating for the X case removes the obligation to make every effort at all times to preserve the life of both mother and unborn baby. It allows for abortion, for the direct and intentional killing of the baby in the womb. It is not necessary to legislate for the X case to ensure that women in Ireland receive all the life-saving treatment they need during pregnancy. 
It is not necessary to satisfy the European Court of Human Rights. There is another way. Other options are available to the government that do not involve legislating for abortion. These include the option of appropriate guidelines, which continue to exclude the direct and intentional killing of the unborn, or a referendum to overcome the ex case judgment. We believe both of these options should be fully explored by the Erectus. As a bishop's conference, we have always held with many others that the judgment of the Supreme Court in the X case is not a basis on which to move forward on this critical issue. In that judgment, the court unilaterally overturned the pro-life intention and the will of the people in 1983 referendum. It heard no psychiatric evidence. It believed that abortion was an answer to suicidal ideation, whereas current research indicates that suicidal ideation rarely relates to a single cause and that abortion itself can lead to suicidal ideation and mental health difficulties. The position it took is also morally unacceptable. You cannot morally equate the possible but preventable death of one person with the deliberate and the intentional destruction of the life of a different, though innocent person, a totally innocent person. How would you or I respond to someone who is suicidal in any other situation? Surely our concern would be to ensure that they receive all the personal, professional and medical support they need. Surely it would be to protect them from harming themselves and to help them to come to a long-term, life-affirming approach to their difficult situation. It is our view that giving sufficient professional support and care should be the priority in response to suicidal ideation in pregnancy. Taking the life of another innocent person with absolutely no guarantee that it will remove suicidal thoughts and the real possibility that it may make the situation worse can never be regarded as a humane or morally appropriate response. That's fine. Just leave it. Pardon? If you, want, you can finish the paragraph here, go ahead. Can I? Yeah. Finally, the ex case judgment potentially permits, permits abortion up to birth. In addition, assurances that legislation will limit abortion to very specific circumstances are unreliable. Any such limitations will inevitably become subject to challenge in the courts. No matter what way legislation is approached, the moral and legislative difficulties posed by the ex case judgment can only be addressed definitively by a return to the people in a referendum. In the meantime, we should be mindful of our excellent system of care for women and unborn children in our hospitals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. And I want to welcome now Most Reverend Dr. Michael Jackson, Archbishop Dublin, on behalf of the Church of Ireland. Seven Thank minutes. You. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Mr. Harper and I would open by expressing our thanks for the invitation to speak today. This presentation reflects our personal views, but is also based on positions that the Church of Ireland has taken in response to previous Oireachtas and government requests for Church of Ireland input into this difficult and sensitive area. The position of the Church of Ireland on abortion is summarised in an addendum to the paper we submitted to the committee earlier this week. We recognise, however, that the judgment in the A, B and C versus Ireland case and the decision of the government to progress the matter through a combination of uh, legislation and regulation has moved the issue on. And thus, we'll confine most of our presentation to the issues which are raised by the expert group report. Suffice it to say that the Church of Ireland opposes abortion, but recognises that there are exceptional cases of strict and undeniable medical necessity where it is and should be an option. There are a wide variety of sincerely held and conscientiously undertaken views within the Church of Ireland as to what constitute such exceptional cases. But there would be agreement that these include cases where the continuation of the pregnancy poses a risk to the life of the mother. In the 1992 X case, the Supreme Court held that an abortion was constitutionally permissible under Article 40.33 in circumstances where the continuation of the pregnancy cons constituted a real and substantial risk to the life as distinct from the health of the mother, and the risk can only be averted by the termination of a pregnancy. The circumstances of the case made clear that this included a credible risk of suicide. 
The Church of Ireland welcomed the judgment at the time as the wording, real and substantial risk to the life of the mother, was very similar to the strict and undeniable medical necessity criterion which the Church has generally held to be appropriate. However, the legal situation has not been clarified and statutory provisions, particularly sections 58 and 59 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, remain in effect and provide for severe criminal sanctions for both women and for those who assist abortion. In the context of the Church of Ireland's previous comments on the issue, we would agree that the position in the state at present is very unclear and that this is unsatisfactory and unfair to pregnant women and medical professions who deserve to be able to make critical clinical decisions in a secure and well-regulated legal and medical framework. We therefore strongly welcome the decision by the government to seek to provide clarity on this issue. Introducing the principles behind the paper, the expert group said the following. There is an existing constitutional right as identified and explained in the X case judgment of the Supreme Court. The state is entitled and indeed obliged to regulate and monitor the exercise of that right so as to ensure that the general constitutional prohibition on abortion is maintained. However, the measures that are introduced to give effect to this constitutional right should not act as obstacles to any woman who is legitimately entitled to seek a termination on lawful grounds. We agree with this general approach. The expert group went on to highlight the sensitive issue of what should happen in the event that a fetus is viable, or potentially viable, but the continuation of the pregnancy poses a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother. We feel that this highlights the need for an effective decision-making pro procedure. With regard to Chapter 6 of the expert group report, this report outlines the tests to be applied in the light of the Supreme Court decision in the X case. And this should include the question of whether it is practicable to preserve the right of the unborn in the process of terminating the pregnancy while comprising the right to life of the woman. The Church of Ireland's submission in 1998 to the Interdepartmental Working Group on Abortion makes clear the Church's position on the right to life of the unborn. We would therefore agree with the approach outlined and with the requirement that the diagnosis needs to be made expeditiously and should be formally notified to the woman. Such a device needs the protection of legislation as medical council guidelines on their own will not necessarily have this effect. The expert group also raised the issue of whether there should be special provision for the, for the rare occasions when the risk to a woman's life is real, substantial and imminent. Our view is that there should be special provision for such circumstances in the light of the provision of the 1861 Act which makes the termination of pregnancy subject to severe criminal sanction. We do not feel it's appropriate for the medical professional faced with an emergency situation where a woman's life is in danger to be constrained from giving necessary treatment in good faith by the risk of criminal conviction. Turning to Chapter 7 and the options for implementation, as a group we welcome the government's decision to seek to implement by means of legislation and regulations which is in keeping with the statement made by the Church in 1998. This approach allows for easier alteration as develops, developments in medical science change during the context of decision making. Finally, I want to quote from a significant women's group within the Church of Ireland because I'm conscious that you have two men representing the total church. This is from the Mother's Union and it's just my final comment. For the moment, we must continue to keep the lines of communication open listen, really listen, as well as talk. Inform as well as undertake to be informed as we can be, from as many different sources and viewpoints as possible. Trust in our medical and trained professionals and try and pick our way through the maze, whilst at the same time recognizing that one size doesn't necessarily fit all and that any decisions and way forward may have to be regularly reviewed as our world continues to grow and evolve around us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Jackson. Our next uh, speaker is from the Methodist Church of Ireland, Ms. Heidi Good. Ms. Good, you're very welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, esteemed members of the Oireachtas, um, on behalf of the Methodist Church, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to come and share with you our views on abortion and our hopes for the upcoming um, legislation. 
we recognize that this is indeed a very uh, difficult and complex and contentious issue with uh, various shades of opinion. Our submission to you suggests that, strongly states that abortion on demand is wrong. And I want to commence this morning by reiterating that view. We do not support abortion on demand, nor for economic or social reasons. The Methodist Church, after a considerable time spent in consultation, takes the view that termination should be available to a mother in four circumstances. Firstly, where the mother's life is at risk. Secondly, where there is grave risk of serious injury to her, her physical or mental health. Thirdly, in cases of gross abnormality, where it is incapable of survival. And finally, in cases of rape or incest. In this complex and diverse issue, we strongly urge the Oireachtas to introduce legislation following on from the Supreme Court judgment in the X case. This is a difficult call to make. We recognize that the fetus is far more than the appendage of the mother's body. That as it goes through the developing stages of gestation, so it should be progressively accorded rights, culminating with full respect as an individual on birth. But the mother is an individual, accorded with all the rights that her fellow men and women in the state are accorded. She has the right to life. She has the right to life-saving procedures. And we believe that includes the right to termination when her life is at risk. Then there is the question of her mental health. Amongst the varied reasons that might cause grave complications for a mother and necessitate a termination, we believe that the mental welfare of the mother must be taken into consideration and included in the forthcoming legislation. If our medical team deem that suicide is a real concern, then we believe that can be treated. But if after appropriate and thorough psychiatric assessment, suicide remains a real possibility, we believe they must be allowed to consider termination as a part of that treatment. No law should attempt to legislate for a specific form of morality or church or faith, but rather to set the minimum standards for the social good. The rule of law should allow maximum individual freedom and only limit that freedom where there's a clear and unmistakable social necessity. In essence, we believe the legislature should legislate for the public good and not to suit us or any particular faith or, or church. And so we strongly urge the Oireachtas to legislate, to allow for the medical profession to make those difficult but life-saving decisions when a mother's life is in danger, without fears of repercussions, and to give peace of mind to the women in Ireland, that they can be assured that their medical team can take all necessary steps to save her life. So I say again that we do oppose abortion on demand. We believe the Christian gospel, though, promotes a just and loving and caring society with emphasis on the dignity and worth of each individual. And so faced with the very difficult choices made to be made by the Oireachtas, we believe that legislating for the four categories that I mentioned at the start is the best approach. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Our, our next speaker, and I want to welcome from the Presbyterian Church of Ireland, uh, Dr. Trevor Morrow, Minister of the Lucan Presbyterian Church, and Dr. Roy Paddington, uh, President Moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, Chairman and members, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the privilege of being here today. As uh, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, uh, we uh, greatly appreciate it, and uh, I personally appreciate it as one whose home is uh, in Monaghan, so it's really uh, good to be here uh, with you today. I think the contribution that uh, we want to make is very much along the ethical considerations that would undergird any further decisions. 
Uh, of course, abortion has uh, been practiced for thousands of years, uh, but the three uh, great faiths, uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, and the Jewish faith, have always upheld the principle of the sanctity of uh, human life. And this has been the very bedrock uh, of our civilization. And it's uh, reflected uh, in our constitution and in our law, especially and specifically in the Offences Against the Person Act of 1861. Now, we believe that there are three general ethical principles which ought to influence any government action. Uh, first of all, that the first responsibility of government is the protection of human life, care for the weak and for the vulnerable, and that includes uh, the unborn child. Secondly, we believe that it is not uh, necessary to engage in metaphysical or theological debate on the status of the embryo and personhood. The embryo should be treated as a person. And thirdly, in a healthy society, the strong make sacrifices uh, for the weak. And so we are of a very strong opinion that in terms of demonstrating uh, compassion and support for women, that the state and the churches and all of us as society have very clear responsibilities uh, in this area. But those uh, basic ethical principles lead us uh, as a church, commending to you a very strong uh, pro-life uh, position. We are very uh, opposed to any question or suggestion uh, of abortion on demand. And we do indeed uh, and have resisted any extension of uh, English legislation uh, into Northern Ireland, uh, for example. In terms of the expert report and the exceptional circumstances of the threat to the life of the mother, we believe that there are a number of ethical factors at play, and with your permission, uh, like uh, Dr. Morrow, to speak to, to those particular factors. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Um, as the moderator has indicated, we, as a church, do not believe that our, it is our responsibility uh, to prescribe or even to advise the Oireachtas as to how to respond to the expert report as to whether they should follow guidelines, legislation, or a constitutional amendment. Uh, we see, rather, our role as seeking to provide an ethical framework within which any future decisions might be made. And specifically, as the moderator has suggested, uh, that it might be useful uh, for, for me, on behalf of our church, can you hear me? Uh, there's, there's some indicating that they cannot. Uh, you might speak into the microphone, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, 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 is, it, is, um, it has been suggested that I might make some comments about those ethical considerations with regard to the expert uh, report and its implications with regard to the exceptional circumstances uh, in which some action will be required, perhaps even by legislation. Now, al already, Two minutes. already this morning, uh, we have heard what would be described as the uh, classic status quo position within the state that the medical profession must, in every circumstance, choose what is right. That is the only option that they have. So when you are confronted in those exceptional circumstances with the life of the child and the life of the mother, you will seek, as I hope they would, to preserve both lives. But as you seek to preserve the life of the mother, the life of the child perhaps will die in that process. It is a passive acceptance in terms of the choosing of what is right. We do recognize, however, that there are circumstances, and there will be in the future, as the medical profession have already indicated, uh, that 
you are confronted at times in a broken, messy world with two things that are wrong. It is wrong to allow a mother to die. It is wrong to take the life of a child. But in such circumstances, it may be necessary to choose what is least wrong, that is, the lesser of evil. And that will be particularly true when you are dealing with circumstances where there is not an immediate and imminent threat to the life of the mother. That, we believe, is a foundational ethical principle that ought to be considered by the Iraqis. Thank you. And I want to now welcome from the Islamic Culture Centre of Ireland, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ali Salim. Dr. Salim, you're very welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members, witnesses, thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Well, Islam significantly values human life, life, established life, and life of embryo. In the Quran, it reads clearly, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ And take not life which Allah has made sacred. But this meaning has been reiterated in another place, in a way that should deter people even from thinking of killing. As Allah said about unlawful killing, مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا That whoever takes the life of a single human being, for other than manslaughter or corruption in the earth, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. And the justice comes afterwards. وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا And whoever saves a life, it is just like saving the entire of all human beings. The Quran warns people who consider abortion since they are not sure that they can provide for it. In the Quran it reads, say, come, I will rehearse what Allah has really prohibited you from. Join not anything as equal with him. Be good to your parents. Kill not your children on a plea of want. We provide sustenance for you and for them. And come may not to shameful deeds, whether open or secret, and take not life which Allah has made sacred, except by way of justice and law. Thus doth Allah command you so that you may learn wisdom. Although maternal health care should strive to obtain the best possible outcome for both mother and baby, in the unlikely event when a group of competent and trustworthy physician confirm that the continuity of pregnancy jeopardizes the mother's life, then abortion could be conducted as the last and the only alternative to protect the mother's life. This permission is based on the principle of the lesser evil of the two evils. In this case, one is confronted with two forbidden things, either abort the unborn child or let a living woman die. Obviously, the latter is of greater importance than the former. Therefore, abortion is allowed to save the mother. Abortion is regarded as a lesser evil in this case because the mother is the originator of the baby. The mother's life is well established. <clears throat> the mother has family duties and responsibilities. The mother is part of the family, or in fact, an essential part of the family. Allowing the mother to die would also kill the baby in most cases. Nevertheless, that the mother threatens to commit suicide, such a claim cannot be deemed as a ground on the basis of which abortion can be conducted. The experience of pregnancy and delivery is hard and could lead to depression. The Quran recognizes this fact and promises in return mothers great reward as Allah says, we have enjoined on man kindness to parents. In pain did she, the mother, bear him, and in pain she gives birth to him. The carrying of the child to the waning is a period of 30 months. At length, when he reaches the age of full strength and attains 40 years, he says, O Lord, grant me that I may be grateful for thy favor which thou hast bestow bestowed upon me and upon both my parents, so that I may work righteousness 
such as thou mayst approve, and be gracious to me in my issue. Truly have I turned to you, and truly I bow to you in Islam. The, the government should think of social and economic means to terminate the grounds of society, but certainly not on the expenses of others' lives. Otherwise, it will be saving a human being by killing another human being. Financial, psychological, physical assistance should be given to assist women who, while pregnant, find themselves in challenging situation. The society should be there to assist women in their difficult situation. Women who have been victims of rape deserve due sympathy and help. But a child conceived in this unfortunate situation still had the right to live. The continuity of this pregnancy, of course, places heavy burden on the mother, which may drive her, likewise many other economic social scenarios, to think of terminating this pregnancy. But killing the child is not the right, is not the right solution. In fact, it is a crime against the innocent human being. It is terminating the innocent's life while the real perpetrators enjoy their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I turn the panel to the committee that the uh, representative from the Irish Jewish uh, community, uh, Rabbi Zalman Lent, is actually detained and is on his way, is delayed, so he sends his apologies. Uh, we will take the atheist of Ireland representative, uh, Mr. Michael Nugent, and Ms. Jane Downey, you're very welcome. Thank Excuse you. Uh, we're here because the 1983 amendment to our constitution has constrained our public ethics. We should not need three days of parliamentary hearings to discuss how a doctor in a hospital should save the life of a dying woman. That should be the absolute minimum rock bottom ethical standard that we should automatically assume from our health system. The ABC case requires you to vindicate this right, it does not require you to limit yourself to only doing this. So please do not ignore the suffering of pregnant women whose health is at risk, or who are victims of rape or incest, or whose fetuses have a fatal abnormality. Please, as well as your other work here, recommend removing the 1983 amendment so that you can democratically decide without these restraints on public policies that are appropriate for the Ireland of 2012. As atheists, we ask you to respect our human right to freedom of conscience. As atheists, we form our own individual ethical beliefs, including on issues such as abortion. But there is one belief which unites us, which is we do not get our morality from gods. And so our laws should not be based on what other people believe the creator of the universe is telling them to impose on us. For example, Cardinal Brady has explicitly told you that as legislators, you should remember that the right to life is conferred on us by the creator. Now please think about the enormity of that claim and the lack of evidence to support it. And it's irrelevance to your deliberations and duties as legislators as opposed to in your personal life. Because even if you believe that there is a creator, as I know many of you do, there is no pathway from that belief to taking any particular specific ethical position on these issues. You cannot argue that the universe had a beginning, therefore it must have had a creator, therefore you cannot legislate for abortion. There's no cause and effect between these ideas. We don't get our morality from religion. We apply our own natural morality to religion. So what are we as Atheist Ireland asking you to do in your deliberations? Well, we're asking you that whatever laws that you pass, please base them on human rights and compassion and on applying reason to empirical evidence. Please respect that individual ethical decisions should be made on the basis of personal autonomy and individual conscience while respecting the rights of others. And please respect that ethical decisions on the issue of abortion and pregnancy should be made by the pregnant woman in consultation with her medical team. Please also consider these specific human rights issues with, relation, with regard to the issues you're discussing. In X, the court said that the risk to life must be real and substantial, but need not be inevitable or immediate. 
In ABC, the court said that obtaining an abortion abroad constitutes a significant psychological burden on pregnant women. In D, the Irish government said that it is an open question as to whether a pregnant woman with a fetal, fatal fetal abnormality has a right to an abortion. Ireland is obliged under various international human rights conventions to respect the equal right of women to health and to physical and psychological integrity. The 1983 amendment is incompatible with our human rights obligations and it discriminates against women on the grounds of physical and mental health. Finally, the X case has already ruled that a suicidal woman has a right to an abortion in Ireland. You have a duty to legislate to vindicate that right. But please don't do it by passing a restrictive law that assumes that pregnant women are lying. Because if you do that, you run the risk of another personal tragedy happening. That a suicidal woman may be denied an abortion. She may go on to commit suicide. There may be public outrage and the law may be changed, but it would be too late for that woman. It took a raped teenage child to establish the right to legal abortion in Ireland. It has taken the death of a miscarrying woman to bring us to these hearings today. Please, please stop this unethical pattern of lawmaking by response to personal tragedies. Please do not limit yourself to the minimal possible response to X and A, B, C and D and the expert group. Please legislate comprehensively based on human rights and compassion. And I will end by saying, please respect the rights of religious people to believe in their gods. And please respect their right to live their lives in accordance with their religious values, but not to impose their religious values on pregnant women who do not share those religious values. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can just point out that it hasn't taken the death of a miscarrying woman to bring us here today. I think that would be a wrong statement to make, but thank you for your contribution. Uh, could I just ask permission from the meeting that we would, that we would, um, uh, when, when the rabbi uh, comes, that we would take his uh, position. Is that okay? Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Okay, there are now 60 minutes for members, um, and could I ask members to be brief and to, if they have a question, to ask it to the relevant church person or, or the members of the atheist organisation, please. Okay, Deputy Keller. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman, and just to welcome the witnesses here from the various churches and, and, and from no churches. Just in, in, in terms of uh, the presentation by the Bishop of Elphin, and he, the statement that the report of the expert group did not present the full range of options available to the government and the Oireachtas on this issue. We believe the option of a further constitutional referendum on this issue should not be ruled out. I suppose the question I'm asking is, what is the, the, the proposal behind this in terms of it? Is it a rollback of the X case, or is it to try and reaffirm Article 43.3 before it was interpreted by the X case? Or what exactly would uh, the Irish Catholic Bishops' Conference be proposing in terms of a constitutional referendum? To get to what point, again, prior to the X case, or just to delete the X case, or to reinforce Article 43.3 of the Constitution as was envisaged. In view of the fact that we've already had two referenda on this particular issue, uh, and both times we asked the Irish people on the substantive issue of suicide, and both times that actual uh, proposition was rejected by the Irish people, I think that you know, we need some clarity on exactly what one would be proposing there. On the broader issue of legislation, I just want to ask uh, uh, all, all witnesses here, um, are the churches saying, and uh, the ADS representatives as well, that clearly legislation that's just defined within the very narrow parameters of interpreting the X case is, is suitable, or do you think that it is uh, that it should go further in terms of uh, fatal fetal abnormalities? Um, should it go further again in terms of uh, mental health, not just a threat of suicide? So what exactly would the varying churches' views be on the type of legislation? If legislation is to be passed, uh, how, how, how defined should it be in terms of beyond the X case? Or you know, should, should, should we be trying to move further? Or do people believe that the X case itself has established the fundamental principle that it is um, only in the event of a threat to suicide that um, a, a termination uh, 
could be provided for in this country or an actual threat to the life of the mother because of, of on health grounds. So just to get a, a little bit of flavour from uh, the churches and others on the, those particular issues. But if I could get clarity on the constitutional issue as well. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Quivino Quillan. I too would like to welcome all of our witnesses here this morning. If I could uh, address um, Bishop Jones, please. Um, could I just say at the outset, there are no proposals to overturn the protections of the unborn in the Constitution in what we're addressing here. And our role, of course, is not decision-making. Ours is to facilitate the flow of information. Yesterday, a very eminent witness spoke of the, what he described as the discredited Supreme Court judgment. He asserted that because no psychiatrist had been consulted, that the process was flawed. Yet on Tuesday of this week, we had five of the most eminent uh, consultant psychiatrists here in this land, including three, the only three perinatal psychiatrists uh, as witnesses before us. And despite the fact that the law of the land by case law and confirmed in the medical guidelines by the Medical Council advises that the a option for intervention in the event of the life of the woman being at risk due to the uh, due to suicidal intent that in their collective experience at no time through all of those years that that has been the case has there ever been a, an intervention uh, undertaken because those circumstances presented why do you believe that with the government's intention to progress what would be viewed by many as confirmatory legislation, why do you believe that that situation would change? And to go to the point by the previous speaker, Deputy Kelleher, in your written submission to us, you state, we believe the option of a further constitutional referendum on this issue should not be ruled out. But well, I think it was very clear in your oral contribution that you go further than not being ruled out. In fact, I think you said that that is something that you would commend, that it is a view that would now strongly reflect the Catholic Church's view that a further referendum is what you would wish. If you could shed some further light on that. And if I may, just very briefly, I know the limited time does not allow us to engage with each of the, the witnesses, sadly. Um, Archbishop Jackson, uh, just to thank you for your contribution also. Uh, in relation to the executive summary of the presentation, and I know you uh, make the point quite particularly in relation to the present preservation of the life of the unborn without compromising the life of the woman at an advanced stage of um, pregnancy, but you speak of should be formally, the woman should be formally notified of the diagnosis. Um, what I just ask, is it correct to extrapolate from that, that the woman, of course, should not only be notified, but should be consulted in all of these okay. positions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Michael I too would like to welcome all our guests here today and thank them for their contributions and enlightenment. I just, I suppose, refer to the document that was submitted uh, by the Catholic bishops and indeed Article 7 of that, the recent decision by the government to introduce legislation with regulations in line with the judgment of the Supreme Court in the ACE case has brought the future of the highly effective two patient approach uh, to, in, to, into serious doubt. And in your view, that the decision by the government is medically unjustified, legally unnecessary, and morally unsound. I want to just, I suppose, um, as the previous speaker said, you, are you definitely there in that statement, uh, demanding that we are asking that we hold a referendum? Thank you. Um, and finally, in this section, and last to hear Kira Connor. and to thank all the um, speakers uh, for their contribution to the debate this morning. Um, We've seen, I think, in the past that theology has the, cap the capacity to evolve uh, with increased knowledge. Uh, we have seen how um, the Catholic Church in particular would allow for natural methods of family planning um, and, and uh, Catholics are, are allowed to prevent life in this way, but have a very nuanced approach then to the use of a condom or a woman taking a pill to prevent life. We have seen how um, we can have a nuanced approach in relation to divorce versus an annulment. 
but isn't a rose by any other name still a rose? And so I wonder, why is it that women, if women and men are truly equal in this country, um, that why women are entitled to less medical care than men in Ireland? And if Irish women are somehow assumed to be more manipulative, more manipulative and, um, and somehow uh, seem to be lying in relation to pretending to be suicidal when they so uh, need the medical intervention and care. Um, and so I'd be very interested to know um, what people's approach is to that, because we know that theology has evolved over a very many number of years. Um, and why is, uh, do we find ourselves now um, not able to deal with the question in front of us? Um, in relation to the submission from uh, the Conference of Bishops, I just, the Supreme Court judgment based its judgment on the presumption that abortion uh, would be a helpful treatment for suicidal thoughts and feelings. The Supreme Court we heard yesterday from very eminent witnesses um, presented their judgment based on the case before them. And so I would like you to respond to that point in your submission. Thank you. Now we have 10 other members of the committee who have indicated to speak, so if I could allow at this portion, 10 minutes for the replies from the churches and the majority have been issued to Dr. Jones um, and Dr. Jackson, but we will allow us to come in so there's about 10 to 12 minutes in this section, so Dr. Jones. Question there, um, what do we intend, you know, uh, when we ask for a referendum to reverse the, uh, the Supreme Court judgment in the X case? Uh, we just believe that that Supreme Court judgment reversed totally the will of the Irish people. 76% of our people voted for Article 43.3 in the Constitution. And our wish would be, as one option, that a referendum would be, give the people a chance to re-establish what they originally wished for and intended and that we were very surprised and indeed shocked that the, uh, the Supreme Court judgment of the X case... The microphone, sorry, sorry Dr. Jones, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Do I go back to where... No, no. Uh, no, that's where we're, where we're coming from. We, we were very much uh, upset, really, and surprised by the ruling of the Supreme Court judgment. We feel it was unsound. We feel also that there was no psychiatrist available an expert in that field, especially with teenagers, uh, to give advice on the whole uh, issue of suicide and mental health. And for that reason, we feel that any legislation that would be based or introduced in the light of that unsound judgment would not, would be, would not be uh, sound. So therefore, that's one of our options. Is to, uh, uh, our first option, I think, would be to have the medical guidelines enhanced so that doctors and nurses have no fear whatever in providing every single possible treatment there is available to, uh, for, the, for the help of the, of the mother whose life is at risk. We would welcome that. But uh, what we, we regret very much if we go down the road of legislation, it's inevitably the road to abortion. And that will change our whole two-patient model. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the life of the mother and the life of the unborn child will, will be no longer equal because we'll be giving the right to someone in certain situations to literally take the life of the unborn. And that we, we can't do. We believe totally in the uh, equal right of mother and child. And I, I might answer in response to one of the statements made, I, I might add, we don't depend on religious reasons or scriptural reasons for that. We believe that each the mother and the unborn child have equal rights in virtue of their common humanity, which, which is, is accessible to human reason. Uh, of course, the gospel, we believe, enhances the whole dignity of the human person and our understanding of human life, but we don't depend on that, and we would never want to impose our understanding from the gospel on any other religious group or, or on any atheist. Dr. Farbatton, do you make any comment? Yes, uh, first of all, Chair, just to thank you for your warm welcome. Um, 
it strikes me as I listen to the various contributions this morning, and it, it, you know, we work together very closely as churches and as faith communities, and Michael and I have debated very honestly and openly in public fora about you know, faith and uh, the challenges to faith and so on. But the thread that has been running through all of our contributions, and I think unites everybody in this room this morning, is our shared desire for a compassionate, caring, humane, and just society. And I think it's always worth coming back to that. What's at issue is how that can be best achieved in legislation in this particular complex and sensitive area in medical practice as well. Uh, and as Bishop Jones has pointed out, I think we have to keep coming back to the fact that life-saving treatment for women in pregnancy is available at the moment. And the Catholic ethical position has no opposition to that. However, just to come back then to the specific questions and maybe to uh, supplement some of the responses that Bishop Jones has given. Um, the issue of the two previous referenda to overturn the ex case or the inclusion of suicide. Your predecessors in the Oireachtas Committee, All Party Committee in 2000, who looked at the 1992 referendum in light of X and what to do in response to X, uh, they acknowledged that that 1992 referendum was incredibly confused and that people on both sides of the argument voted to defeat the referendum. So it wasn't a clear, to use the shorthand, pro-choice, pro-life uh, result. And similarly, as we all know, uh, I'm sure it's, it's an easier one, the 2002 referendum, the margin was extremely tight, uh, the, the defeat of it, uh, but there was evidence that large numbers of pro-life people uh, voted to defeat it as well. But beyond all of that, could I suggest that, you know, there is a reason why we hold our judges and courts, and particularly the Supreme Court, in the highest of esteem, and we treat seriously, very gravely, any judgment that they give. However, that we don't have judges and lawyers running the country, or indeed framing legislation. That is your responsibility, a responsibility that is churches we respect and seek to assist in terms of, as you've invited us to do, offering our views. But in that regard, you are free as legislators uh, to consider the wider issues. The Supreme Court looked only at the legal issue and evaluated the situation in terms of law. As Bishop Jones pointed out in his opening presentation, there are psychiatric developments that need to be now taken into account. There's moral issues, the inability to equate, you know, the, the, the uh, possible but not certain and preventable uh, uh, death of someone in suicide as opposed to the certain death of a child. And our response to that is, in the 21st century, what reflects a compassionate, humane and intelligent society? Is it not, is it not that we uh, provide the best possible care and support to make someone, uh, help someone to make a life affirming decision. And just finally for the record, in response to Deputy Conway, uh, no one from the Catholic Church has ever said in any official role or responsibility or in any statement that we believe women will you know, somehow try to mislead. We have never ever said that. The jeopardy arises from the experience in other jurisdictions of trying to legislate in this area, the vexed nature and the real danger of unintended, sincerely unintended consequences, as well as the, uh, the, the, uh, the difficulty simply of trying to limit legislation in the context of the breadth of the ex case judgment. So any attempt to limit, in principle, could be challenged. Uh, and that's why, in conclusion, I would suggest that trying to address the legitimate concern to ensure that doctors, for example, can act freely in the ethical way we've described and that they currently do, with a protection of guidelines, by the way, uh, they're not in jeopardy if they follow the guidelines, but if greater reassurance is required in that regard, then uh, we, we've, we're you. trying to develop new legislation on the basis of X is like trying to build a new house on a condemned site or a problematic site, you know. Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much indeed. Um, first of all, if I can address the question of formal notification. I know it sounds rather cold and in the third person. That's not what's intended. The formality of it is that it would be, as it were, structured and part of a system. The notification is more than information. It has to do with consultation.
Um, in relation to the whole question which has been raised to do with uh, a referendum, I think I made it very clear in our presentation that our concern would be for legislation. And I say that specifically because I bring us back to the, well, it's not a distinction I made, it's a kind of suggestion I made, but real and substantial risk to the life of the mother and strict and undeniable medical necessity. I think that's